we get to work with these founders every day. We, you know, we get to solve really like gritty problems with them. Uh, you know, we, we get quite tactical, you know, we'll do things as, as tactical as, as leaning into product hunt campaigns and helping companies get number one on product hunt or, uh, you know, helping to build out their pricing strategy or turning up to, to hard sales calls and actually helping with the, with the sale or, you know, leaning in on customer feedback on product, you know, we, we, we kind of do it all. And I think that's one of the big differences for us is that, you know, we, we do actually lean in almost like a, like a, an experienced consultant alongside our capital and, and that, you know, the founders don't have to pay extra, extra money for that. Like, I think that's a big benefit. A lot of founders will typically go and engage people on a retainer for these same levels of services. We do it as part of our investment. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 156 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, strategies that you succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have Matt Brown, the co-founder and managing partner of Black Nova Ventures as my guest for this episode. Prior to becoming a VC, Matt was the co-founder and CEO of Dunsafe a cloud-based safety platform that grew to 1.5 million paid users globally before being acquired by HSI in 2020. Now, alongside being one of the founding team members of Upflowy, he is also the co-founder and managing partner of Black Nova Ventures, a $20 million early stage venture capital fund built for B2B technology startups. And despite only recently publicly announcing their fund, they have already made 23 investments to date. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including Matt's journey in launching, scaling, and eventually exiting Dunsafe, dealing with co-founder breakups, how to build investor conviction for a pre-revenue and even a pre-product startup, the rise of the founder VCs, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with Matt Brown. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Hey, Rohit. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. Matt, it's been a long time coming. Very, very glad to have you on the show. But for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, absolutely. More than happy to. So I've always been uh, super interested in, in building things from a really young age. You know, my very first business started at about the age of 13, where I would scour the northern suburbs of Sydney looking for computer hardware that I could uh, tear down and, and build back together and, and find extra pieces and build working working computers. Um, and I was really lucky my dad would follow me around and, and, you know, lend me the car to be able to fill the boot with all of these things that I would find. Um, and then I'd go to the North Rocks computer market and find the extra pieces that I needed. Uh, and then I'd sell those finished products to teachers, to friends, to friends of friends, back when, you know, computers were expensive and and not a commodity, like, you know, not every, every household had one at that point in time. Um, and so, you know, that was, I, I guess, where I really kind of got used to, you know, buying and selling and, and being involved in an entrepreneurial pursuit. I then turned 18 and uh, finished high school. And I didn't really want to go to university. I was I was not definitely not an avid studier. I didn't love school. I much preferred making money um, and building things. And so mum said, well, look, you know, this, this side thing you're doing isn't going to turn into anything. You probably need to get a job. Um, I'd always idolized Kerry Packer and read a bunch of the early books on, on Kerry. And I saw a job going at ACP magazines in the mailroom. And that was my first kind of foray into a corporate job. Quickly after three months of backbreaking mail cart pushing, um, I managed to find a job in the same uh, business in the IT team, moved my way through that business. And then my first partner, she uh, she was from a small country town called Wyala in South Australia, um, convinced me to make the move uh, to South Australia with her. Uh, when I landed in Wyala, there weren't really any IT jobs, um, but thankfully there was a, a mining, uh, a new mine site that had just been commissioned uh, and I took a health and safety job there. And that's where I guess my very first successful business idea came from. We, 
we had a, an incident where somebody uh, nearly seriously injured themselves. We found that from that, that there were a bunch of failings that could have been solved with software. I got to build some software for that. Uh, and then uh, thankfully, I was able to build a business off the back of that idea. Had to do some side work at Leighton and a few other places first. And uh, as we built Dunsafe, we took that to one and a half million users, took it to exit uh, in North America with Ward out of Chicago. Um, I also built another business uh, called Wispley that came from experience at Leighton and a friend there. Uh, went through the whole Y Combinator program, uh, spent time in Silicon Valley, raised money there. Uh, came back to Australia, um, obviously after the exit as well with Dunsafe, then I had this period of working out what I wanted to do next, started angel investing, invested in a little more than 50 software businesses. And then the culmination of that experience led me to build a VC fund. Yeah. And that is just a brief synopsis of why I was so very excited to get you on the, on the pod, Matt. There's so many things that I want to dive into, but one thing that I want to um, sort of pick on that you, that you mentioned in terms of your story, especially when you were a little bit younger is, you know, now there are so many different um, accelerator programs, resources that are available for, for startups. And, you know, there's definitely a, a much easier pathway to, um, and sort of well-trodden path for, for people to turn their idea into a business. But, you know, if I kind of think about my own experience and also talking to a lot of the guests on the podcast, uh, you know, one of the commonalities is that a lot of people sort of tinkered around with things when they were quite young, um, you know, when they were in high school or, or potentially even younger. But, you know, for, for a lot of people, it wasn't a very immediate career path or there didn't seem to be that really clear link into actually I can turn this into what I really do. What did that process look like for you um, from, you know, turning, turning 18 and sort of deciding you didn't want to go to uni and trying to figure out what, what that sort of next step looked like? Yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely spent a number of years, you know, working my way through corporate, kind of just stepping up a ladder and, and, and no real intention, you know, probably from, you know, 18 to 27, it was just, you know, as long as I was progressing in an upward trajectory and, and, my, and I typically, you know, weighted that on the fact of, you know, was my pay each week or month getting a little larger, that was really what was driving me in those early years. And it wasn't until um, that serious incident that I mentioned in, in mining and then getting involved in a project where I got to help build some health and safety software for the group and deploy that across the group that I guess that sort of, you know, pre-existing entrepreneurial flair I had when I was younger kind of reared to the surface. And it was it was that that, you know, really gave me an interest in going and building for that problem. Um, I didn't do it straight away, though. I had to, you know, I wasn't in a position where I could just jump out. I had had a partner and I had a child. I had children. And uh, it was it was kind of, it took a few years. I went to Layton. I spent a bit of time in construction. I went into uh, banking for a little bit so I could do the side hustle. I unfortunately separated with my first partner and uh you know was in a bit of financial trouble and it was funnily enough the culmination of the experience you know not having really anything to lose by being in a pretty dark place and having a real chip on my shoulder to solve this problem after being told that there wasn't a big enough market for health and safety software that uh i i took the leap and and built my first business so i think it's it's often it's it's multifaceted but i think that you know definitely from from the people that i speak to that have built software businesses they've all had a side hustle at some stage yeah absolutely and you know to be honest I think this has come up a couple of times on the podcast as well there's you don't need the additional financial stress of how you're going to be able to pay rent or pay the bills when you're also trying to make a startup like a fledgling startup idea work um you know I think that one of again one of the commonalities not in every case but in, in the majority of cases is you know everyone sort of continuing on with um some form of sort of full-time or part-time work just to be able to pay the bills but just I guess digging into that a little bit deeper and I guess unpacking that obviously Dunsafe has had an incredible journey as you mentioned 1.5 million users successfully exited last year um but what did that sort of process look like and how long were you sort of you know working on it as a side hustle and what did that inflection point look like for you to to finally go full time yeah no look that's, that's an awesome question um so you know i i took the job at cba because at Leighton i was uh heading up a pml of a big transformational change i was working every hour of the day i was traveling constantly and so there really wasn't an opportunity to work on my side hustle there. And so I had to had to find a job that had work-life balance. I was really lucky the Commonwealth Bank was such a place. They were going through a similar transformation to the one I'd just been through. So I was able to take a lot of those learnings and have a lot of tailwinds into that role. Um, but also, you know, I had to build up uh, to a point where the business could, could support me before I could take the leap because, you know, I had kids, I had 
now child support to pay as a, as a, as a separated um, parent. I had a lot of credit card debt uh, and a lot of debt. I, I, I took on most of the debt from my previous relationship. And then I had the credit card debt from building the, the side hustle, you know, investing in this business alongside my business partner. And so, you know, this business was started off the back of a couple of people's credit cards, like a lot of businesses are. Um, and I wasn't in the personal situation to be able to really jump out and, and work full time on it until I met Darcy Norton at Adventure Capital. And Darcy, you know, at the end of his first fund, we were introduced just by Matt Allen, who uh, was the was, was one of my business partners at Dunsafe, and uh, we took the last investment from them in their fund. Now, um, the other thing that was unusual but fantastic for the time was they agreed to front me with a loan. Uh, to enable me to pay off some of that debt and to go full time. And so that was really the catalyst that enabled me to, to jump in and start running Dunsafe. Yeah, it was actually, um, you know, one of the people that I got to speak to in doing research for this interview was Darcy. Um, he's also a former podcast guest as well. Uh, we, we had a great chat a couple of years ago now. But one of the things Darcy mentioned was, you know, this is one of the, the last uh, and best investments that Adventure Capital ever did. And he also kind of mentioned that, that story as well um, in terms of, I believe it was 100K in, in debt. Roughly. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it was. So I, I, it's 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 a big number. I don't recommend anyone get 100k of credit card debt. Um, it was a good half of that was was my pre-existing uh, financial stress in 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 getting separated, and then the other half of that was building a business from scratch. I'm amazed the banks would lend me so much credit, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, like you said, so many businesses are built off off the back of sort of um, you know putting things on credit cards as well. Do you have any advice? Uh, I guess sort of looking back on your own experience, obviously a lot of the founders that you work with now um, in how they can either sort of better manage things financially or just advice that you have in terms of how to how to approach things uh, a little yeah. bit better for founders. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think the reality is times have changed a lot since when I built my first business. The reality is in just that short seven or eight years, um, our markets are a lot more mature. The ecosystem is a lot more mature. And so uh, it's it's a lot more normal for founders to be able to raise pre-revenue, uh, to go through accelerator programs or generator programs and get that first investment rather than needing to, to necessarily rack up big credit card debts. Now, I think it's really important for founders to have some skin in the game but everybody's level of skin is very different and you know you have to take into consideration you, you don't want you don't want to bet the farm on an idea you know you want to be able to get some validation you want to be able to spread risk just as investors spread risk founders should spread risk and i think that you know as as your business matures and you know as you start to raise more money and have a more successful business it's also okay to take a little bit of money off the table i've you know sort of 10 years ago that was a real no no but i think today secondaries are quite normal and founders you know should take enough money to enable them to remove the burning pain so that they can focus on getting the job done now they shouldn't be removing all of the pain because at the end of the day they want you want the hunger there to solve the problem build something really big and get the exit but um, the reality is that you know if you can remove some of the initial pain it means you'll have a much a much better business life I think yeah, and I guess you know switching gears slightly from a from an investor perspective as well. When you're going through due diligence or, or the things that you look for in, in a team, what does that right balance look like for you? Again, um, I, th I think it's really interesting. You know, one of the things that we look for now as as a fund is is the founder hygiene, both as individuals but also as as a cohort. So if you think about a two or three person co-founding team, sometimes you'll have one co-founder who maybe had a previous exit and is in a really strong financial position. And you might have another co-founder who, who can barely rub two nickels together or two dollars together. Um, and so what we often look for is, you know, how can we make it so that the founder that is potentially most at risk of financial stress can you know, de-risk a little bit to enable them to run for the long journey rather than, you know, feeling that constant pain and pressure, um, which may actually give subpar investment returns. You know, one of the reasons that businesses fail and that people, you know, uh, jump out of startups is because the financial stress on, their, on, on them as a person and also on their family can be the thing that causes them to say, you know what, I'm going to go take the high paying job over building the business. And so if you're able to really help that founder to find the, and strike the right balance, I'm not saying making their life so easy that they don't want to work hard, but, you know, at least removing that pain. I think that's definitely something that we look to do as an investor. And it might not be straight away. It might be 
get a later round. But if they, if, if you can help founders to see the light at the end of the tunnel, it definitely makes the whole situation a little bit easier. I think then, you know, on an individual basis, you know, we really look into, you know, what are the underlying human traits of the person that you're backing that's going to help them to be really successful on this journey? Um, and when you then look at the cohort, you know, does at least one of the founders have deep domain expertise? Does at least one of the founders have a deep desire to genuinely solve this problem for the long term? And would they be doing it no matter no matter what happened? Yeah, really, really great advice. Uh, speaking of founders as well, you've touched on uh, Matt Allen, who was one of your, your business partners. He's, again, one of the former podcast guests that I got to speak to in, in relation to, to doing research for this interview. And uh, one of the things that he also mentioned was uh, he decided to leave Dunsafe early. And I know that sort of co-founder dynamics are so important and also just so difficult to get right. And also one of the, the bigger reasons why a lot of businesses fail. Just having, you know, I guess sort of unpacking that experience. And I think you've mentioned previously that you've had sort of similar circumstances in, in other businesses as well. Do you have any advice for, for founders who are potentially in that situation where a co-founder sort of, you know, decides that, you know, it's no longer the right thing or, or that they have to sort of really change the, the dynamic in terms of what they're able to contribute to the business? There are so many points to unpack in that question, right? But I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 st I'll start by saying that when you get into a business with a co-founder, you know, everybody does it with all the right intentions typically. Now, I'm sure there are odd cases where that's not true, but the, the majority of people get into it for the right reasons. They want to solve a problem. Uh, they like the, the idea of working with this other person and they feel like the, this person is going to be the right person that there for the journey for the long term. The reality is that often when people start businesses, they forget, you know, it's, it's just like getting into a, a marriage. And typically, if you were going to get into a marriage, you would you would spend some time dating that person, meeting that person, getting to know them, understanding the fundamentals of what makes them tick, understanding whether you're going to be a compatible match. You know, do you have the right balance of shared interest? Do you have the right balance of, of difference of opinion so you can, you can continue to delight and surprise each other over the long term? And it's no different being a founder uh, or a co-founder in something. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things I would suggest to any person thinking about building a business with a co-founder is they spend a lot of time getting to understand the person, but also getting under to understand what drives them, what motivates them and why they're in it. And, you know, there are things like the 50 founder questions. There are, you know, numerous ways that you can meet founders, whether that's joining something like the Antler program or Founders Institute or putting a, a listing up on LinkedIn and, and, and screening people like I've seen people doing more, more recently. But there's, there's a number of ways you can meet the right person. Maybe going back to the story, though, of, of, of lived experience. So when I think back to building Dunsafe, you know, uh, I met Matt and he was my other co-founder in Dunsafe. Uh, so there's three Matts. Matt and I met through a mutual friend in a bar over a beer and quickly decided to build a business together. So we kind of skipped all of the pre the pre dating. And then Matt and I had worked with Matter once on a software project and kind of connected the three of us. So we started on, I, I guess, relatively loose foundations in that we hadn't really gone and spent the time getting to know what would be the right mix going forward, nor did we really understand you know, what the three intentions were in terms of what sort of business we wanted to build, how we wanted to build it and what it needed to be. Um, nor did we kind of identify where the personality matches the right personalities to build a business together for the long term. And so, you know, I think that in that instance, we didn't, we didn't nail that. And I think what we did do, which, which I'm really proud of, is work on a way that enabled, you know, Matter to step back and focus on what he really wanted to focus on. You know, he went on and got into, into to become the, you know, the absolute wizard of angel investing and tech he is in the ecosystem because he was much more interested in being portfolio rather than potentially coding a software business for the next 20 years. And what we wanted, somebody was going to, you know, roll their sleeves up and just constantly build software. We didn't get that alignment right. And I think that was, was you know, a challenge that needed to be addressed. And I think that, you know, Matter was an incredible sounding board for me and has continued to be an incredible sounding board for me. And, you know, I'm grateful that we're able to find a way that while it wasn't a perfect uh, separation of founders, I think in the long run, we've ended up salvaging a really strong relationship out of that. And that that similar experience happened at Wistly, the second business I built, again, with the, the tech co-founder who wanted to be a tech co-founder until they realized what it meant to be a tech co-founder and then realized they just wanted to be a software engineer. Uh, they didn't want the stress 
of leading a team and managing information security and managing reputational risk and those sorts of things. And again, you know, I, I think that was just not finding the right fit at the right time. But, you know, then I go on to the next business I founded, which is Upflowy and then, you know, Black Nova Venture Capital with Darcy. Both of those businesses, years of pre-existing relationship, uh, years of understanding what makes things work uh, between us and finding a really strong dynamic for building a business together. So I think, you know, if you if you're going to start a business with somebody you don't know intimately, spend the time just like you would if you were if you were marrying a person. Yeah, and obviously there are you know a range of different things like having a vesting schedule in place where you can sort of protect protect the company and the founder. But I guess for the benefit of anyone that's going through that particular process at the moment um, that has to deal with a potential co-founder breakup or kind of changing of dynamic, do you have any advice on how founders can sort of approach that conversation or how best to, to sort of, um, you know, manage that situation so that it doesn't negatively affect the company and, you know, doesn't sort of pull the rug uh, away from the company itself? Yeah, I, I think there's there's two again two pathways to take. The first one is to remember that everyone's human and to put yourself in in that person's shoes. If 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 for whatever reason you know you're having to make the decision that this co-founder relationship isn't working and you're the right person to continue building the business and you need to have that discussion with the other person. And if there's if there's three of you, if two of you are having that discussion with the other person, you you need to really put yourself in their shoes. You also need to recognize and reward the contribution to get to the point at whichever point you're at and try to work on something that's fair. What, like, if you were in the same position, what would you feel comfortable with if, if somebody was coming to you with this news and how, how would you potentially react? And so I think it's really important to have empathy in these decisions and to come up with mechanisms that are fair. Now, you, if, if it doesn't go in the right direction and if, if it creates, you know, it, it will initially create uh, tension. So it's always good to leave some space, not try to get the resolution on the day that you've made the announcement, give it a little bit of time to be able to sink in on, you know, for everybody and then to come back together in the, in the, in the cold light of day. But if it doesn't work out, you know, uh, it's really important to be clear on what your legal arrangements are. And, you know, in hindsight, ideally, you would have the right vesting plans in place. You'd be reviewing those vesting plans at each capital round. You would have KPIs built into all of your founder agreements to ensure that uh, everybody works to the level and expected. But if you don't, and you're kind of finding yourself in this position, then you may want to engage a mediator. You may want to bring in somebody who's impartial and, and a third party. You don't want to go to the courts because the courts just chew up money, slow business down and, and can, can erode shareholder value. But if you can bring an independent mediator, somebody that, that you both trust or somebody that's completely independent um, who can come in and help to get to a resolution, I, I typically find that that works best. But I think being, you know, Trying to trying to come to a fair conclusion and being empathetic definitely helps the process. Absolutely. Shifting gears and speaking of mediation, you know, first of all, congratulations on the Dunsafe exit last year. But you. Um, you know, I guess you know, from a from an ecosystem perspective, you know, a lot of early stage founders may hear about a successful exit um, and those sort of announcements, but not really understand what the process looks like under the hood or, or what that entails. Can you share what the process looked like from a Dunsafe perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we were never looking to be acquired. That wasn't what we set out to do. We were actually raising a, you know, a Series B financing round. Um, we were growing tremendously as a business um, and had a hell of a lot of things to, to go out and achieve. However, you know, we had the first acquisition offer come through that was serious and we're in the middle of the fundraising round and the fundraising round was taking longer than we had hoped to find the right lead. And so we started to, I guess, look at that in parallel. Now, when, you're, when you have an acquisition offer come in, typically, you know, the, there are a number of reasons that people acquire software businesses. You know, the first might be that it's strategic and you're being acquired by, you know, a corporation that wants your, you know, wants your talent or wants your product or, you know, or, or wants a combination of both in their business. They might be acquiring customers. Um, if it's private equity, they might be acquiring a platform to then roll up other businesses into that platform, or they may have acquired a platform and be looking to roll you into that platform and roll your customers in. So there are a number of different reasons that acquisitions happen. 
And so one of the first things you want to identify is, 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 is why? What's the intent of this acquisition? What's the intent of this acquirer? And does that align with you know, your vision for the business? Now, if you're coin operated and you're purely just looking for the financial return, you may not care which one it is of those many options. But if you're interested in staying on in the business and seeing your brand live on and all of those sorts of things, then, then you probably want to be quite clear on the acquirer's intentions um, and, and what they're looking to do with your business once they acquire. Typically, what will happen is they'll do a light level of tabletop DD, no, no, not dissimilar to capital raising, and then they'll provide a letter of intent. Uh, when you receive a letter of intent, uh, it, it's typically non-binding, but it does have a lot of kind of, I guess, provisions that are built in to stop you from shopping around and to stop you from potentially, you know, following a different line of process. And so when that LOI came in, we had to make the conscious decision to stop capital raising and to lean into that process for a period. Now, the first one fell over. Um, and so we went through all of that process. And at the, at the 11th hour, the, that company got acquired. And so our first acquisition deal completely collapsed. Um, wow. And so, you know, we then had to go back to the drawing board of do we go back down the acquisition path or do we go and fundraise again? I think mentally for us, we kind of decided that acquisition was the right path because we got to the end. And so then we started our own process of engaging potential suitors. And so I think typically you want to have, ideally you have a few suitors that are, are chasing you down because then you've got the ability to have more of a competitive process and you'll hopefully get a better outcome. Um, but again, you want to kind of check back in on why you're doing it because you want to make sure the acquirer is the right acquirer, especially if you're going to roll into the business and continue working for a period. And so I think, um, you know, what, what typically happens post LOI, you go into a deep DD process, they, they literally look through everything, they look for reasons not to buy, and they look for reasons to reduce the LOI price that they put in front of you. Um, and at the very end of that, they do a thing called working capital to identify how much money needs to stay in the business to keep the business operating versus what do the founders get to get to take out of the business and the shareholders get to take out of the business. Uh, and then you, you kind of wrap the process up and, you know, you, you all of a sudden you're working for a new a new a new overlord and so that was my experience you know we we got procured or, or acquired by HSI which was backed by Ward Capital Ward were looking for a platform to roll up other opportunities into and so for us it was the right thing the business wasn't wasn't going to just be acquired for its customers it was going to be acquired for its brand and its technology and its people and they wanted to invest and so what we could see is that we were it was just like raising you know that next round of capital but with now 400 employees built into the business that could help drive it and so that was the right decision for us and that was the outcome that we had after going through that experience what well, was that a difficult adjustment for you in terms of going from as you mentioned at the start of not really in Tending to be acquired to, as you mentioned, sort of suddenly being rolled into a, a 400 plus person organization. Yeah, it was definitely it was definitely an experience. I, fortunately, I'd had the corporate experience, so I kind of had some idea of what to expect. I think for me, we were also fortunate that for the first year at least, they didn't really want to muck around with anything. I kind of just wanted to let it operate the way it did. And so for the first year, the business kind of operated as expected. Mm just with new humans, new capital and new opportunity. But, you know, eventually what does happen is they have to work out how this piece will work in with the greater cohort of the, of, of the group. Uh, and that's when, I guess, change starts to happen. And so, you know, you need to, you need to mentally adjust for that happening, that, you know, you're, you're no longer going to be calling all of the shots, that, you know, there will be decisions that are made that you're no longer accountable for making or are made without your, even without your knowledge, potentially, that team members that you, you brought in will Will, will change roles and sometimes those decisions will happen without you and so you there is a lot of adjustment to be made and it's not for everybody and look for me personally I'm, I'm a builder so that's why I, I started building more things you know it was a good opportunity for me to take money off the table to see my my baby done safe continue to be built under a safe pair of hands and to be able to start you know building black nova venture capital and upflow and other things amazing and i guess yeah, that sort of perfectly leads leads into Black Nova. Again, congratulations on the official announcement last week for, for Black Nova. Uh, you've raised your first, I believe it's $11 million? Correct, yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. So, so we, uh, you know, basically we're an early stage venture capital limited partnership. We needed to have a minimum of ten million dollars raised before we kind of, you know, were were official. Um, and so we waited for that process, and we've just tipped over the eleven million dollar mark and continuing to raise now for the next next uh, short period. Congratulations. Um, you know, one thing that you sort of alluded to at the start was, you know, getting to work with some of the people that you've worked with over an extended period of time. One of those people being Darcy, who is alongside you, the managing partner of, uh, of Black Nova as well. Do you want to share, I guess, kind of the, the dynamic and I guess the importance of having the, the right people around you, you know, whether it's your own startup or whether it's kind of launching into, into your own venture fund? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Darcy is an incredible human. He's a guy that I've gotten to work with now for the last decade. He served on the board with me at Dunsafe. Uh, he was a person that I would go to when times were tough, when I wanted to celebrate. He was just a, a fantastic sounding board for me. And so when I was considering what I wanted to do next, he was the first person that came to mind that I, I wanted to go and, and build the next thing with. And so um, I remember I was standing at a, at a conference and he was he was in Argentina. I think he might have been working from a washing machine or he just flipped his car. <laughs> it was one of the many crazy stories he had in South, in South America. But uh, I called him and said, look, mate, I, I really want to do this thing. I've been doing a lot of angel investing. We've just had the exit. You know, uh, I think that we'll be a really good team. You know, you've always wanted to build more ecosystem players and be focused on early. I really like, you know, the kind of founder investor journey where I back companies and then I lean in with time and expertise to help them. And so I think together our heads will be able to build a real, something really special. And, and, and he agreed, thankfully, and came back to Australia. Um, obviously, COVID helped a little bit. COVID hasn't helped a lot of things, but it helped this um, because he could no longer kind of travel the world. And he had been doing it for two years. So that's a long enough holiday in my book. But, you know, it was definitely the catalyst for him to be able to jump back to Australia and focus on this. And um, I think, you know, it is really important, uh, especially when you've done it a few times, you, you get to a point where, you know, you really want to focus on the humans that you spend the next decade or two with. And he was a human that I've, I've really enjoyed working with and could see myself continuing to work with. We have the right balance of skills. Um, you know, we, we have very different backgrounds, even though we've always been in this space, you know, Darcy comes from it very much with kind of that financial mindset, very much from that, you know, sort of VC experienced background, but also as somebody who's built companies, and I come from very much the, you know, zero to one and, and one to 10 focused sort of startup entrepreneur turned angel. Um, and I think we're a really powerful combo. And then, you know, we were able to identify the gaps we've had. And I think we've built an awesome team around us, both with uh, the first employees that we've brought in, but also the venture partners that we've brought in to ensure that we just have uh, an unbeatable bench of expertise that can provide more than capital to the things that we back. Yeah, I was just about to say, I was very jealous of Darcy's uh, photos from South America as well. But uh, yeah, just just kind of speaking about the team that you've built as well, it was just really interesting having a look at your team page on the Black Nova website and sort of the, the structure of how you've gone about in building that in terms of having two sort of managing partners. And then I, I believe it's nine venture partners that are, that are listed there. Yes, um, yeah, t 10, 10 total. Um, Matt and April are obviously uh, a husband and wife venture partner team. So you could call them nine or 10. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to share a little bit about, uh, I guess, the sort of unique approach in terms of you structuring the, the fund that way? Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's, it's something that works incredibly well in the US. And I think Antler have done a really good job of it locally as well, in that, you know, when you have a fund, especially so, so VC funds, and for those who don't know how they how they kind of work behind the scenes, you know, you don't have a, a huge amount, especially in the early days, you know, once you're a billion dollar fund, you have a little bit more money to play with. But in the very early days, you, you're running off a 2% management fee. And so on a $25 million fund, that's that's roughly 500k that you have to, to build your bench of, of people. And off that management fee, you know, like I, I don't take any, any management fee and Darcy takes a very small amount. So, you know, but by the time you hire a few people you, and you've got an office premise and, you know, a bit of administration cost and general cost, like that, that goes pretty quickly. And so um, one of the ways to augment that is to have a really strong venture partner group. And so um, the venture partners are part-time resources. Um, so they, they basically give up about four hours a week of their time to lean into the, the companies that we invest in. And in return, we give them some of the performance fee, the carry fee. So they're incentivized on the upside. So everyone's incentivized in the right way, which is we want to maximize 
the, the success of these companies that we invest in so that we have a really good return to our limited partners, our investors. But, you know, all of the VPs and the management team share in that performance. And so everybody is, is, yeah, is really aligned beautifully to, to lean into all of these businesses and work incredibly hard for them. Yeah. And, and speaking of alignment, you know, one thing that both Darcy and uh, Matt Allen shared when I spoke to them about sort of your, your specific in, uh, investment approach, but also just Black Nova generally is the importance of having that operator background. And, you know, I think having been a founder as well, it's, it's very difficult to replicate the founder empathy that you have. I guess how, how important has that been for, for Black Nova, both from a differentiation perspective, but also, you know, your approach to, to investing in companies? Yeah, look, absolutely. From a dif- differentiation approach, it's, it's, it's super interesting. And I don't think anybody in the market has as many founders in their core team as what we do, uh, especially for our size of fund. But, you know, uh, putting that aside for a minute and putting all, all the good things that it says about us on the box, I think what it, what it really does underneath it all is give us a really good opportunity to, you know, to lean into companies, lean into founders and really help you know, uh, for me personally, I, I'm, I'm not just doing this to make money. I've already made money. I like, I'm already pretty comfortable on a, pre- I'm a pretty simple creature in terms of what, what I need to, to live and to, to enjoy life. And so, you know, what I really love doing is working with awesome founders and helping the next generation of this ecosystem. You know, this, I, I think our ecosystem is the ultimate circular economy, you know, and I think if, if more and more founders kind of lean in with their time and with their capital to invest in the next generation, then Australia is going to be an incredible place in 50 years time. It's already an incredible place, but it's going to be a more incredible place. And so I think that's what we really get to do as a team is, you know, we get to work with really bright founders solving real problems in areas that we have expertise and can actually be helpful in, not areas that we have no idea about. And, you know, we get to work with these founders every day. We, you know, we get to solve really like gritty problems with them. Uh, you know, we, we get quite tactical, you know, we'll do things as, as tactical as, as leaning into product hunt campaigns and helping companies get number one on product hunt or, uh, you know, helping to build out their pricing strategy or turning up to, to hard sales calls and actually helping with the, with the sale or, you know, leaning in on customer feedback on product. You know, we, we, we kind of do it all. And I think that's one of the big differences for us is that, you know, we, we do actually lean in almost like a like a, an experienced consultant alongside our capital and, and that, you know, the founders don't have to pay extra extra money for that. Like, I think that's a big benefit. A lot of founders will typically go and engage people on a retainer for these same levels of services. We do it as part of our investment. Yeah, I, I mean, an example of, uh, of what you just spoke about in terms of leaning in and, and helping companies. Um, I believe it was a story that Darcy told me about you flying to Newcastle or going to Newcastle a couple of weeks ago and sort of putting hands on keyboards and actually building out the first version of, of the product as well as an example. What does that, what does that sort of leaning in look like from, from your perspective and like how involved does, does Black Nova get for, for companies that you invest in? I think the big thing for us is we, we want to be still hands-on tools as, as, a, as a team. And so what we mean by that is that we don't ever want to become irrelevant. We don't ever want to become, you know, ivory tower in the way that we invest. We want to be in the trenches with the founders that we back, working with them every day to solve the problems that need solving. And that's not in, in a way of getting in the way of our founders or preaching to our founders on, on how they should run their business. At the end of the day, we're backing these founders who know the problem that they want to solve way better than we do and you know have their own expertise. But if we can lend a, lend a harm, and I think with both empathy and humility in, in that approach, um, I think that it, it really helps companies to move faster. And, you know, so far our founders have, have really enjoyed that. Like, you know, a number of our founders have become investors in our fund because they've been so impressed with, you know, what we've done with them. But, you know, really good example. So absolutely, um, I still operate in one of our investments quite heavily. Um, you know, Upflowy, I, I'm down as one of the creators and I'm, I'm in that business very regularly, uh, both on, you know, on product and on sales and on go to market. But, you know, even in businesses where I, I, I have got less day-to-day involvement, you know, we're still very 
very active. You know, we one of our businesses that was acquired recently, you know, we lent in very heavily on their product hunt launch. We became power users of their product. We would actually go and, and encourage other people to, to utilize their product. You know, remote social, another investment we've made. Again, power users of their product uh, out there actively helping people to onboard to that platform. So I, I think, you know, the more that we can do that, the, the better, especially in the early days, because it's so that zero to one period is so hard. That first million in revenue is the hardest million that any company will ever bring in. And if we can really help to unlock that, but then also give them visibility, uh, help lift some of the fog on the next three million, the next five million, then I think we can really help to grow these companies alongside our founders. Absolutely. And and what does that sort of sweet spot for investment look like for, for Black Nova from a stage, from a focus perspective? Yeah, so, so we are the earliest of investors. So we love to back our founders pre-revenue, sometimes even pre-product. Um, we've backed uh, founding teams at the very start of their journey as first lines of code have been written. We've backed founders as, as they've kind of just got a product ready to take to market and they're thinking about a product hunt launch or they're thinking about, you know, their, their very first customers paying. You know, we've I think out of the 23 or so deals, we've done 19 of those deals were pre-revenue. And so, you know, when we, when we say we'll back early companies, we'll really back early companies now that doesn't mean we back every early company we can't a vc fund is a scarcity game and you know we have limited capital to deploy uh and so we'll probably only work with you know sort of 40 or so companies in this first fund but you know uh we really do want to be the earliest of investors i think the next thing we focus on is you know we want to invest in things that we deeply understand there are plenty of investors that want to back the next driverless car or the next rocket to the moon we believe we're backing our own types of rockets in the next b2b software where businesses that are looking to export globally from day one. And so, you know, we've got a real focus on team, team construction, deep domain expertise in the problem that they're solving, um, the ability to unlock, go to market rapidly because of their networks or because of our networks or a combination of both. And we love uh, what we call boring software. So things that solve real business problems for real industries that are buying today and will continue to buy for the next decade. Yeah, um, just in packing, again, one thing that you mentioned, which was uh, backing companies, potentially pre-revenue, pre-product. It's a conversation that I've had with multiple founders um, at sort of various stages. Uh, you know, one of the, the challenges that they've found is getting investors to build up conviction in them when they don't have uh, a huge amount of traction in place. From your perspective, as you mentioned, you can't invest in everything, but for the, the companies that you've invested in pre-revenue or, or potentially even pre-product, what are things that you look for or what are things that founders can demonstrate to help build that uh, conviction for you as an investor? Yeah, look, I, I think there's, there's a number of things that can really help. Like the first one I've mentioned quite a few times is we, we love backing teams that have got at least one deep domain expert in the team. And, you know, we love backing a founding team that has proven traction at something in their past. So we look quite deeply into their past and, and how that they've, you know, attacked life to date. Uh, and I think that's something that we're really interested in. We also are really focused on founding teams that bring something unfair outside of that domain expertise to their go-to-market. Now, that might be that they have experience in building communities or they have experience in growth or they have experience, you know, potentially as, uh, you know, a thought leader in a space. If, they, if they've got some access to network, whether that be community driven or experience driven, that can be a real, you know, tailwind that we have expertise in leaning into to support that team in, in really taking their product to market quickly. And so I think there's some of the things that we look for. And so, you know, for us as a fund, founding teams with deep domain expertise, good diversity in the founding team of thought and of capability, you know, uh, working respect for each other uh, and an ability for us to see that, that respects long-term and, uh, you know, the ability to build moats through through time and through hustle, like that that's a great team that we'd love to back. Speaking of hustle, uh, on the last podcast episode, I had Ash Davies from Tableau on yep. and he spoke about, um, I guess, his approach in, in building a portfolio of, of businesses himself, um, not just in tech and how the experience that he has or the insights that he gains from, uh, you know, running a variety of different businesses helps him build a, a better business at Tableau. You know, obviously you mentioned that you get hands-on with all of your portfolio. You've got 23 companies in your portfolio now. You've got a venture fund. You're, um, you know, one of the co-creators of Upflowy as well. How do you, first of all, balance and structure your time with with all of these kind of things? And I guess what, what are some of the pros and cons or, or like 
again, like how do you, you know, make sure that whatever you're doing is, is the most impactful um, thing and, and the best use of your time? I think you know, that last sentence you absolutely know. It's, it's what is the most impactful thing I can do with my time at any point in time is something that I always have in the back of my mind. I know what I'm good at. I also know what I'm not good at. I know that, you know, if I can empower somebody who is good at, at doing that thing to do it and give them the freedom to do it and remove any constraints and give them the resources, then they're going to do a much better job than I will. And I've, I've always been, I think I'm really grateful to some of my early experience in portfolio management in corporate, uh, but also in, in kind of running multiple startups in, and, and I think also some, some fundamental human traits that my mum gave me around kind of, uh, you know, trust, trusting first and, you know, letting people be their best, their best self, I think is definitely something like, and also building people up, like trying never to knock people down, always trying to build people up. I think are things that I, I, fundamentally believe in and have really helped me to be successful. I know the areas that I'm strong at, you know, I've always been pretty strong at brand. I've always been pretty strong at go-to-market. I'm, I'm good at things that are abstract and strategy-driven. What I'm terrible at, I'm terrible at detail. I'm not the detail person in my team. And I've got a ton of people around me that are very detail-oriented that help to, help to make sure I don't drop the ball on things because I tend to, tend to trust and jump in and, and fall in love with things. And then I've got a great team of people that help to, to you know, make sure the right level of, of reason and data is brought into every decision. Decision. And I think that, you know, knowing that about yourself makes you a much more effective person. I think, you know, another thing, another thing that's super important is being, you know, really retrospective and humble enough to, to know when you, you don't know something, humble enough to ask for advice, humble enough to bring the right people in. I, I, I know I'm, I, I would be really upset if I was the smartest person in the room. I love being, you know, kind of just able to empower the smartest people in the room to perform really well. Yeah, just, just on that, you know, I think self-awareness is, is such an important um, marker for, for founders to be able to build the right type of team around them. Uh, you know, I know personally, there's nothing like a running a startup to really humble you and show you all the things that, that maybe uh, you're not so good at or don't come as naturally to you. But I guess, again, for anyone at the, at the very start of their journey who maybe hasn't gone through that process or hasn't been able to get that level of insight, again, any advice on, on how founders can get better at sort of understanding what, uh, what their strengths are and, and what are some areas that they potentially need to fill in with, with the right people around them? It's it's really a learning journey, and look, I, I I say this now with you know many years of experience. But when I started out, I was just I was cocky, I was driven and hungry to go out and prove myself. But I didn't have that humility. It took it took quite a few punches in the face to really get to a point where I understood that I needed to be the way I am today. So this it's it's an evolution. It's definitely not kind of you know core. I, I still remember times back you know where people gave you know you need to be more humble, you need to listen. You know I I definitely. I, didn't, I wasn't born with those initial traits and I think you know one, one of the the funniest things that I kind of reflect on was not necessarily funny but you know when I started Dunsafe and I came out of corporate I came from a reasonably senior management position at a pretty young age and I thought I knew everything I thought I was the wizard of Oz and I was going to come in and I was just going to nail this business six months later I was pretty much in tears into my beer going I don't know what I'm doing and what do I you know? and I think I, I I had so many lows in those first six months so I think if you're a new founder the, the first thing is know that you don't know everything you are going to experience very quickly that you don't and it's how you react to that uh, that will determine whether you're successful or not. I think, you know, your ability to take on information and take those punches in the face and roll with them and kind of go, okay, I need to readjust my human and I need to move forward as a better human will, will be the thing that will determine whether you're successful or not. Yeah. And just adding to that point, it's also important to know that everyone goes through that as well. Everyone, um, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's easy to see, you know, all of the press and kind of the fundraising and everything. But, um, you know, to your point, everyone has those moments, you know, if not six months in, a couple of weeks in that you go, oh, my God, what was I thinking? I was a slow learner. It took me six months to realize <laughs> I, I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of learning as well, you know, I think one of the things that you sort of touched on in terms of how you've approached building the founding team at, at Black Nova is some of the lessons that you've taken from your experience in the US. I guess what, are, what are sort of other insights you were able to gain from your time in, in building companies or from your time in the US that you think are, are sort of really big opportunities for Australian founders? 
I, I think one of the things that I I really took away from the US and that we almost we're almost allergic to here in Australia is that in, in the US, everyone loves a salesperson. People are happy to be sold to. People love people that are successful and they embrace people that take themselves out of their comfort zone to, to go and do something that's really challenging or scary. I think in Australia, we still have a little bit of that. I, I, don't, I, I don't know why we have it in our culture, but, you know, and I hate saying tall poppy syndrome because it gets overplayed, but I do think there is this, we, we like to, we don't like to take ourselves too seriously. We don't like to put ourselves on a pedestal. We do like to, you know, tear people down a little bit, especially if we see them doing it. And I think that if you're a founder and you've got global ambitions, you actually have to shake some of that kind of, you know, Aussie humility in the sales process off a little bit because otherwise you're outcompeted on a global stage. The reality is that people that are born and bred in the US and, and build businesses over there, they're innately they come in across to an Australian as innately cocky the reality is they're just confident and they're they know that they they won't get torn down so they fly and you know I think you really need to to embrace some of that if you want to be successfully globally in startups you need to you know you need to still know your cultural norms in the market you're operating in but you definitely want to take a leaf out of their book when you're fundraising or when you're selling in those markets fantastic Matt Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your experience and insights. There's personally so much that I took away from that episode and I'm sure that our listeners did as well. For anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, look, absolutely. Please check out uh, blacknova.vc. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter. My DMs are open. My Calendly, I shouldn't say my Calendly link's open, but it is open. <laughs> uh, and so if you if you want to catch up, I, I do, we do try to be open book, but uh, obviously because I'm open book, it can take me a little while to respond. So I apologize if you're still waiting on me. And um, it's been awesome to be on your podcast today, Rohit. I've been a big fan of the series and loved hearing a number of my friends on over the years. So, so thank you for having me. Uh, so great that we can finally make this happen, Matt. It's been a long time coming. I will make sure all of those links, except for your Calendly, uh, are in the show notes for this episode. <laughs> but uh, Matt, once again, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks for listening to episode 156 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.